Spring has officially sprung. I assume. I've been trying not to look outside too much, honestly, so I can't say for sure, but I do know that the new slate of anime that typically accompanies the warming weather and onset of birdsong is here. Well, mostly. ReZero Season 2 and a few other things did get delayed to summer on account of, you know, the thing. And Netflix is doing their thing with brand new animal, that is to say, nothing for the next six months or so, but still, a heck of a lot of new anime was just dropped at our doorsteps, and as usual, I've taken it upon myself to watch it all, sort the good from the bad, and let you know which 10 anime this season most deserve your attention. These are the ones to watch for Spring 2020. In troubled times, it's only natural to crave a little comfort food, and my first pick of the season, Princess Connect Redive, has satisfied that craving quite nicely for me. Based on a mobile action RPG of the same name from Cygames and animated at their in-house studio, Cygames Pictures, it's a relaxing, swords and sorcery themed moe comedy type thing where a trio of adorable girls and their inept male companion pal around a lush magical countryside, doing quests, eating food, and generally just having a good time. It feels, in a lot of ways, like Konosuba, if the God's blessing on this wonderful world bit wasn't dripping with implied sarcasm. Less cynical, more lighthearted and cute. Which, in a world where Bofuri and Endro exist, isn't exactly the most attention-grabbing pitch. You know, this is the sort of thing that's only really good when someone who's really good at that sort of thing is in charge of it. Lucky, then, that Cygames tapped the director of Konosuba himself, Takaomi Kanasaki, to helm and write the project. So, Princess Connect is funny. Like, really funny. The writing doesn't have quite the same dark edge as Konosuba, at least not overtly. There is some really fucked up stuff at the periphery that the girls are too pure and naturally immune to consequences to notice, but it's thoroughly charming and adorably goofy nonetheless. And of course, the show has some of the strongest visual comedy I've seen since well, since the Konosuba movie. The mute amnesiac protagonist in particular is even better at comedic ragdolling than Megumin, and that fluid animation works just as well for the moe elements as it does the gags. The waifus in this show are top-notch, especially Pekarine, who's a little, well, a lot stupid. She kind of makes Aqua look like Eris, but that gives her a certain naive charm, and there's just Something about her that I really like. I can't quite put my finger on it, but I'd like to. And also the rest of my hand, and then the other hand, and then just like, like get my face in there and... <laughs> Sorry, I uh, lost my composure there. Princess Connect Redive is definitely an indulgence, but it's a thoroughly delicious one, and as the plot seems to be heading into food porn territory, with our heroes forming a gourmet guild at the end of episode 2, I can only see it getting tastier as it goes on. If you have any affection at all for Konosuba or comedy anime in general, do not sleep on this one. And if you haven't laughed quite enough once you're done with it, my next recommendation has you covered. Kakushi Goto is the story of Kakushi Goto, a single father with a terrible Kakushi Goto, namely that he Kakushi Gotos. More specifically, the thing he draws for a living is an audacious adult comedy manga that he never, ever wants his precious little daughter Hime to find out about. Ever. And he will go to absolutely insane lengths to ensure she never does. He heads to work in a suit every morning before changing into more casual clothes he can actually draw in, already a mighty sacrifice since he prefers to draw naked at home, and drills his employees to pretend they're office workers just in case she ever shows up, which only makes their already demanding jobs even harder, but boy is it funny to watch. Though there is a certain tinge of melancholy underscoring all the comedy, Goto-sensei struggles to balance working and weaving his web of deception against actually giving his daughter the love, time, and attention she needs to grow up healthy, and considering that the series framing device shows a 16-year-old Hime finally discovering her dad's secret, with Goto quite conspicuously not around, the stress and heavy workload probably isn't the best for his health either. 
To those of you out there who recognize this art style, that blend of wacky, off-the-wall dark humor and hefty emotional weight paired with proficient Japanese punning probably seems equally familiar. And indeed, this is the latest work of Koji Kumeta, the mangaka behind Joshi Raku and the singularly brilliant Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei. Oh, and he was also brought on to design the characters in the eccentric family, presumably because his simple, elegant line work is kind of perfectly suited to animation, as I'm sure you can see for yourself right now. In addition to being a talented artist, Kumeta Sensei is a phenomenal writer with a wild, unpredictable sense of humor and a penchant for the absurd, who's at his best when he can blend those elements with commentary about real life. And since, naturally enough, the life of a mangaka is the subject he knows best, Kakushi Goto is is both an enlightening watch for manga fans curious about the quirks of the job, and an absolute laugh riot in general with a strong emotional core. Out of the tidal wave of mindless monster battling things that formed in Pokemon's massive wake, Digimon Adventure set itself apart with a cast of flawed, interesting characters, a fascinating, surreal setting, and a strong central plot to tie it all together. I loved it more than just about anything else as a kid, but as is so often the case with these things, it was never quite as good as I remember it being. Nostalgia does tend to sand the rougher edges off of anime, sprucing up stiff, limited animation in our mind's eye and editing down meandering weekly storylines to their most riveting highlights. I bring this up because Toei Animation has gone and remade Digimon Adventure for the age of smartphones. And while after the tepid disappointment that was Try, I didn't want to get my hopes up for it, somehow the first episode of this 2020 reboot actually is nearly as great as I remember Digimon being. Its plot is tight, reworking Mamoru Hosoda's second Digimon film, Our War Game, into an origin story of sorts for Tai and Izzy. And I've gotta say that Someone's Hacking Tokyo is a lot more of a compelling place to start a story than Where Are We? Oh God, Giant Bug Run Away. I've always thought the dual world dynamic was the most interesting thing about the Digimon concept. That's why Tamers is my favorite season and why I'm such a sucker for Mega Man Battle Network. So it's cool to see this new version of adventure jump right into that instead of making us wait for Myotismon. With none of the other characters in sight, we also have more time to get to know Ty and Izzy properly. Gogglehead gets to showcase the wild courage that defines him as he runs to rescue his mom and sister from an out-of-control train, inadvertently synchronizing his heart with Agumon in the process, while Izzy's wisdom is put to great use as he guides them through their first battle. And there's plenty of time left over to make that one hell of a battle. Agumon kicks some serious ass here, tearing through foes in a gorgeous flurry of claws and fire. Ty gets some licks in too, digitizing a few of the monsters with his bare, okay, gloved hands. But of course, all of that's just a prelude to the showdown between Greymon and the digivolved form of these mysterious slime monsters. And holy crap is the digivolution ever up and running in this show. Just look at this. Listen to this. Ah. The few scraps of sinew left holding my jaw on after that were summarily shredded when Greymon horked up a flamethrower to counter the blob's big beam attack. Also, that music... I cannot believe how stupid good this show looks and sounds. It's early days yet, obviously, but Digimon Adventure has the potential to recapture the magic of the original and then some. I highly recommend checking it out whether you're an old school fan of Digimon or someone curious about the series. Digimon isn't the only blast from the past airing this spring. Listeners is a brand new mecha anime from Studio Mappa, but from the beats its story hits to the oddly detailed noses of its art style, it is distinctly reminiscent of Ureka 7. And with a script penned by that series lead writer, Dai Sato, based on an original concept by Makaku City actors creator Jin, it feels closer in tone to Bone's surfing mecha classic than any of the studio's own attempts to follow it up. I know that alone will be enough to convince a lot of you out there to pick the series up here and now, but for the rest, Listeners is set in a broken world besieged by giant, shadowy monsters called Earless that have somehow destroyed the very concept of music itself. 
The only thing standing between them and what's left of humanity are the players, special people with oversized speaker jacks in their body that allow them to connect with and control transforming mecha amplifiers known as equipment. Our hero, Echo Wreck, is a fanboy who's memorized every last word that's been written about every last one of the players, which is definitely a little excessive, but to be fair, he doesn't have much else to do besides picking through the massive scrap heaps surrounding his hometown of Liverchester. He's also taken some spare parts from the yard and built his own near-complete equipment with them, but that's just a hobby for him. The boy has long resigned himself to life as a professional junk collector. The world's a harsh place, and he knows better than to dream. Well, that's what he thinks, at least, until he stumbles on one heck of a find in the scrap. An unconscious, amnesiac female player who he decides to name Mu after the symbol on her core. It's easy to draw parallels between Mu and Ureka, but her personality couldn't be more different from that blunt, awkward girl. In a world that's forgotten what rock even is, Mu is a born rock star who only knows how to dream big. She wants to see the world, accomplish things, and having taken a shine to the naive scrap picker, she's bringing Echo along for the ride. It's a familiar tune, to be sure, but sung in a distinctive voice. Between this and Makaku City actors, it seems Jin likes playing around with abstract, metaphysical concepts in his stories, and those are enough to set listeners apart from its obvious inspiration. The show's a little rough around some of its edges. For a series about music, its sound mixing could stand to be a heck of a lot better, but it's built on a strong creative foundation, and with original mecha anime being so few and far between these days, that counts for a lot. Here's hoping it won't go the way of Darling and the Franks. Speaking of anime with horny female leads and references to Norse mythology, Gleipnir is a story about monsters. Its misanthropic teenage protagonist, Shuichi Kaguya, has inexplicably acquired the ability to transform into a big-headed mascot-looking dog thing at will, gaining super senses and strength in the bargain which he uses as you'd expect a teenager in anime to use such superpowers, first getting all depressed about it, then saving a beautiful classmate from a burning building as the story kicks off. But it seems our hero isn't just a monster on the outside, as he's barely able to stop himself from assaulting the girl moments after saving her. Horrified at what he's becoming, Shuichi runs away from the scene, but not soon enough to avoid being ID'd by his would-be victim, Claire, who confronts him about it at school the next day and shortly thereafter reveals her own monstrous side by pushing him off the roof just to confirm her suspicions. And while he's worried about what his urges might have done to her, she only seems to care so far as they give her more leverage over Shuichi, whose powers she intends to use to her own violent ends. Sadistic, manipulative, and unconcerned with the value of human life, including perhaps especially her own, Claire Aoki was dangerous enough without a superpowered servant at her beck and call. And to make things even worse, Shuichi's living mascot form comes with a gross flesh zipper on the back, so Claire can crawl inside him and partake in the slaughter with his own two hands. Which seems like it will only loosen the boy's already tenuous grasp on his remaining humanity, though the other monsters occupying their town don't seem like they'll give him much of a choice. And yes, the way she does it is incredibly sexual, like you even had to ask. Though this is somewhat stronger stuff than your average etchy series. Gleipnir is raw, sweaty, violent teenage id transmuted into anime form, horny in an incessant, overwhelming, deeply uncomfortable manner that bleeds into the brutal violence until the line between those aspects of the show all but disappears. I could be wrong, this could just be extra edgy etchy, but the impression I'm getting is that all of this is very intentional. This is a horror anime that plays on the fear of losing control of oneself, and it seems to be leveraging the squickier side of anime fanservice, along with a heaping helping of more conventional body horror, to put viewers in the headspace of its confused, terrified, 
hormonal anti-hero. I'm not sure how it'll shake out when all's said and done, but I can say with confidence that the first few episodes of Gleipnir have been the best kind of roller coaster ride, thanks in no small part to the incredible work of Pine Jam. This is their first TV anime production since Gamers and Just Because aired back in 2017, and the Sakuga on display here tops both of those already impressive efforts handily. While it's scheduling, not budget, that allows anime to look this good, the the fights in Gleipnir especially feel like they're just throwing money at the screen. And on that note, The Millionaire Detective Balance Unlimited is about, I mean, it's kind of right there in the title. Well, Daisuke Kanbei is clearly at least a billionaire, so they could have translated that better. But yeah, this is a buddy cop show where a very, very rich dude joins a Japanese police precinct, specifically the basement division where they keep all the screw ups, and uses his obscene wealth to do cop stuff and pay for all the damages he causes, much to the chagrin of his by the book co worker, Haru Kato. Haru sincerely believes in the ideal of justice and expressly rejects materialism. He doesn't regard banking, investment, and other idle profit streams that might buy one a car like Daisuke's as respectable jobs, and if his porn-addicted partner is to be believed, he was apparently busted down from first division to the misfit cop dungeon despite his skill as a detective, specifically because he prioritizes justice over money, implying his superiors think it's not a cop's job to do that. Hmm. The show doesn't seem to look too kindly on its more affluent co-lead. Well, I mean, the camera looks on Daisuke very kindly, and why wouldn't it? He's a certifiable 11. But his personality's like a 2. He repeatedly demonstrates a wanton disregard for the safety of others, ramming his car down a busy street and very nearly over a mother and child to reach a crime scene, almost pushing two suspects to their deaths without a second thought, and standing back and smirking after Haru's efforts to save one of them leaves him dangling from a bridge. When Haru calls him on his shit, specifically telling him he's not a goddamn superhero, Daisuke's first response is to offer up a conciliatory bribe. This is a man who thinks he's above it all, using an immense fortune he didn't earn to play detective because, in his own words, he's bored. It's the Batman, Iron Man, philanthropist superhero concept taken to its logical extreme. Daisuke even has his own version of Jarvis that mainly serves as an automated checkbook and also hacks traffic lights for him. Balance Unlimited clearly intends to have fun with this premise. It's a Tomohiko Ito joint after all, so dynamic camera work and bombastic action abound, and the bill shown at the end of each episode indicates that we're in for even more explosive property damage as it goes on. And maybe trying to balance that fun against an effort to satirize the Batman trope will be akin to the simultaneous having and eating of the cake. Shoot, maybe the show will end up unironically celebrating and glorifying its own stupid excess. And if it does, maybe I won't care. Because despite the potentially unfortunate political implications of its premise, boy is the millionaire detective Balance Unlimited a fun ride. And frankly, Daddy Daisuke is way too handsome to eat anyway, so maybe we should just let him do whatever he wants to us and, you know, try to enjoy it. If the ever-growing community of self-described Daisuke Kanbei simps on Twitter is any indication, we may not even have to try that hard. Worker solidarity isn't the only thing under dire threat from dangerously handsome rich men this season. My Next Life as a Villainous, All Roots Lead to Doom, has perhaps the most novel premise of any isekai series in recent memory. I mean, it's not unusual for isekai series to depict otaku being sucked into the worlds of their favorite RPGs, but an otome game? That's a new one. There are worse fates for a young otaku than a life surrounded by her favorite husbandos, of course, but that's provided she gets to stay around them, and also alive. Which doesn't seem too likely for the otaku girl now inhabiting the body of Katarina Kleiss, the rich bitch rival character who ends up dead or exiled at the end of every route in her favorite dating sim, Fortune Lover. Having died young once already, Katarina isn't exactly eager to repeat it, and so from the moment a nasty knock on the head jostles loose her old memories, she uses everything she knows about the game to reverse her fortune, perhaps overcorrecting a bit in the process. Overnight, 
Kate, the prissy wannabe princess, transforms into a boisterous and friendly tomboy, taking on hobbies quite unbecoming of a high society lady as part of her death flag counter strategies and sweeping every baby future bishi she meets off his feet. Entirely inadvertently, I should add, because they're all like eight and while her adult brain isn't the smartest, honestly, it's at least not so broken that she'd be into that. Kaio and Satoru shippers. My Next Life as a Villainess is an adorable romantic comedy anime with a fun setting, likable, well-rounded characters, and stunningly gorgeous artwork. I mean, just take a second to drink in those watercolors, man. That's the good shit. With Bookworm back for a second season as well, not to mention Digimon, it's a great time to be an Isekai fan. And if you're looking for a portal fantasy without the portal part, wish we had a name for that, Tower of God has you covered. Kind of. I mean, its hero, 25th Bam, boy, what a name, does enter the titular tower through a portal, but he's from another part of the same fantasy world, I think. He seems to have spent most of his life trapped inside a cave, and his backstory has yet to be fully filled in, but that's a big part of this series' charm. Tower of God kicks off by putting us in the exact same position as its hero, totally in the dark about everything, save for the fact that he has to climb the tower, whatever that entails, in order to meet Rachel again. A simple motivation, easy enough to understand, yet this Rachel is so precious to our hero for some reason that he'll quite literally leap into the jaws of death for another chance to see her. Quickly though, we start learning more. For starters, Bam isn't alone in this tower. Apparently enough people live here to have their own crappy society with a monarchy and everything. And it seems that monarchy's princess isn't afraid to break some rules and cause some chaos. Each floor of the tower has a guardian who tests visitors to see if they're worthy of ascending to the next one. To aid them in that process, everyone in the tower is given an invisible magic PDA called a pocket that translates foreign languages and holds all their shit for them, possibly with other functions that haven't been shown yet. And those who reach the tippity top of the tower apparently get a wish granted. Though of course that's a lot easier said than done. Bam has a long journey ahead of him if the 473 chapters and counting of Korean webtoon that inspired this anime are any indication, and I'd guess there's plenty more to learn about the tower. In just the second episode, a fast-paced battle royale type thing, we've already been introduced to a staggering array of unique characters spanning a range of strange races, and many hints of deeper lore have already been dangled before us. Most intriguingly, a magic liquid called Shinsu that permeates the tower and grants power to those who can withstand its pressure. Sounds like a quality shonen battle premise if I've ever heard one. It's hard to tell looking up at it from the very bottom, but I get the impression that this show is pulling me into a vast, varied, and intricately detailed world. And if you've heard me talk about One Piece or Trails in the Sky before, you know how much I value that feeling of discovery. Now, it can be a little frustrating to fumble through the early bits of such an intentionally obtuse story, but thankfully Tower of God makes the process of discovery as appealing as it possibly can be. Its world is brought to life with a slick, simplified art style reminiscent of Mob Psycho that animates beautifully while creating an appropriately dark mood, and that mood is greatly amplified by composer Kevin Penkin doing quite possibly his best work yet. This show is ticking a lot of boxes for me already, and the more I find out about the webtoon it's based on, the more excited I become to see more, especially knowing that the author has apparently planned out the story more than eight years in advance. I'd advise my fellow anime lorehounds to keep a very close eye on this one. The only thing I love more than having a compelling, fantastical realm to explore is seeing fantastical takes on our own reality or something resembling it, at least. In particular, I've always been a sucker for steampunk, and this season has one absolutely abysmal example of the subgenre in Shin Sakura Taisen, the animation. Fuck that show and the 15 minutes I spent watching it. But it's also offered up a promising original series in Apare Ranman which follows eccentric Japanese adventure Apare Sorono and his reluctant samurai babysitter Kosame Ishiki as they take part in a grand race across late 19th century America that's shaping up to be at least a little wacky. 
Thus far, we've only actually seen our heroes pull their souped-up steampunk roadster to the starting line of that race in an in medias res promise of things to come. The first few episodes are largely concerned with establishing their personalities and introducing their equally eccentric rivals, and I'm fine with that because their antics have been thoroughly entertaining. Apre is a spoiled, disaffected rich kid, scion to a powerful family of merchants who see his inventing as little more than a wasteful pastime. He's not particularly concerned with what others think of him, though, or with societal norms or, you know, laws, which is why diligent Ishki is assigned to watch over him after he's tossed in jail for crashing his car through a local lord's house. Unfortunately, before Ishki can pick the kid up from the slammer, Apare breaks himself out, and in the ensuing chaos, the pair end up rocketing into the open ocean on an experimental speedboat that, with a bit of help from a steamship, accidentally carries them all the way to LA. It's a fun way of kicking off the story, and these early episodes are brimming with solid humor, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't eager to see the race get underway. I mean, with Stone Ocean still unconfirmed, and also it might be the apocalypse, this may be the closest we get to a Steel Ball Run anime this decade. Up to this point, the series has been a little light on action, but if the bangin' OP is any indication, the Trans America Wild Race seems like it'll live up to its name and then some. I'm talking shootouts, samurai swords, and most importantly, steampunk Segway battles. Also, like, maybe a little racism, but of the goofy, mostly harmless G Gundam variety. And culturally insensitive or not, every last one of these character designs pops off the screen. This show is just so much fun to look at, and it's been equally fun to watch. My last recommendation of the day is a little less vibrant, but no less beautiful. Sing Yesterday, for me, has a certain cinematic air about it. Its shots are enhanced with depth of field and lens flare effects, and its backgrounds are beautifully lit and awash with photorealistic detail. The series seems to be cribbing some notes from Comics Wave and Makoto Shinkai, and who can blame them, but with a cool, muted color palette and rough-hewn line art, it really makes that style its own. A bit darker, more mature, which is appropriate given the story being told here. This isn't some supernatural coming-of-age saga, rather it's a very real tale of the failure to do so. Rikuo Uozumi has been out of college for six months now, yet he's still working part-time at a convenience store and has all but given up on actually hunting for a real career. He's got an interest in photography that he's not quite confident enough to really pursue, but other than that, he doesn't have much going on until a mysterious girl named Haru Nonoka and her pet crow Kansuke wander into his life one day. Haru presents herself as dark, cool, and aloof, but inside she's a bit of a mess. Not only is she a high school dropout working at a bar, but she has a massive, hopeless crush on the convenience store clerk, and she's been carrying that torch for years. Which is especially unfortunate since Rikuo's torch burns only for his old college friend Shinako Morinome, who moved away from Tokyo after graduation, but has since returned to take up a teaching position at a local school. The same one Haru dropped out of. As you can imagine, things quickly get complicated between the three of them, even more so when Episode 2 introduces Shinako's younger childhood friend, Ro Hayakawa, who is crushing on her hard. As the title hints, everyone in Sing Yesterday for me is weighed down in some way by their past, and the turbulent emotions brought on by this love quadrangle only make carrying that weight harder as they struggle to take steps toward an uncertain future. Clean as the show looks, it's all profoundly messy beneath the surface, much like real life. People and their relationships are complex and difficult to navigate, and while simple catharsis can be very enjoyable, my favorite romance anime are the ones that aim to really capture that. With Yoshiyuki Fujiwara, the director of Plastic Memories, at the helm, I've got a feeling this series is going to reduce me to tears at least once before it wraps, and I am very much looking forward to it. Those were the ones to watch for Spring 2020. And since you guys keep asking me to actually list these lists, here they are again for easy perusing. If that's not enough to keep you occupied for the next little while, or if any of these shows end up being delayed on account of... the thing, 
like I'm pretty sure the millionaire detective already has been, sorry about that, you could always check out my recent videos about longer anime and games to get you through quarantine, or I guess I could mention a few other good shows from this season that didn't quite make the cut. Wave Listen to Me is a show about a waitress who's drunk and rambling about an asshole ex gets picked up by a local radio station and inadvertently turns her into a talk show sensation. Gal and Dino is a cute, slow-paced slice-of-life comedy about a gal who lives with a dino, with bold mixed media segments courtesy of the team behind Pop Team Epic, and Arte, I know I'm not pronouncing that right, is a neat little period piece about a 16th century Italian noblewoman who defies societal norms to become a renaissance painter. Also, if you're not already tuned into them, Ascendance of a Bookworm, Fruits Basket, and Kaguya-sama are all phenomenal anime, and it is absolutely worth catching up to follow their new seasons. With all that said, let me know in the comments below which anime this season have you most excited and why, and if you're looking for something else to keep you entertained, please go watch my roast of Dragon Ball Evolution if you haven't already. I think it's one of the best videos I've ever made, and Kami knows we could all use a good laugh right now. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.